Once in a while, in long century periods, some vast new knowledge comes to the slowly unfolding race of man through cosmically inspired geniuses or men of supervision who have an awareness of the reality which lies beyond this universe of illusion. This new knowledge is of such a revolutionary nature in its time of coming that whole systems of thought, even unto entire cosmogenies, are rendered obsolete. When each cosmic messenger gives such new inspired knowledge to the world, the whole human race rises one step higher on that long ladder of unfolding which reaches from the jungle of man's beginnings unto the high heavens of the ultimate complete cosmic consciousness and awareness of unity with God. Thus it is that man has ever been transformed by the renewing of his mind, with new knowledge given to him since his early beginnings. Through the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita of the early Brahmic days, through such ancient mystics as Lao Cha, Confucius, Zoroaster, Buddha, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Epictetus, Euclid, Muhammad, Moses, Isaiah, and Jesus, whose cosmic knowledge utterly transformed the practice of human relations of their day. Then dawned a new day of the gathering of so-called empirical knowledge, which is gained through the senses by research and observation of effects of motion in matter, rather than through the consciousness of inspired mind in meditation, which is the way that mystics and geniuses acquire their knowledge. Since the days of Galileo, this undependable method of gaining knowledge through the senses has served to multiply man's reasoning powers by teaching him how to do marvelous things with electricity and the elements of matter. But not one great savant of science can tell the why or the cause of his familiar effects. If asked what electricity, light, magnetism, matter or energy is, he frankly answers, I do not know. If science actually does not know the why or what or cause of these essentials, it necessarily follows that it is admittedly without knowledge. It is merely informed. But information gathered through the senses is not knowledge. The senses sense only effects. Knowledge is confined to the cause of effects. The senses are limited to but a small range of perception of the effects which they sense. And even that small range is saturated with the deceptions and distortions created by the illusion of motion. It is impossible for the senses to penetrate any effect to ascertain its cause, for the cause of illusion is not within effect. For this reason, the entire mass of so called empirical knowledge which science has gained by reasoning through the senses is invalid. Let us examine some of these conclusions, which form the basis of scientific theory and see why all present theory is invalid, and why its entire structure has no resemblance to either nature's laws or its processes. I will now enumerate some of these unnatural theories. Basic Misconceptions of Science 1. The cardinal error of science lies in shutting the Creator out of his creation. This one basic error topples the whole structure, for out of it all of the misconceptions of light, matter, energy, electricity, magnetism, and atomic structure have grown. If science knew what light actually is, instead of the ways and corpuscles of incandescent suns which science now thinks it is, a new civilization would arise from that fact alone. Light is not waves which travel at 186,000 miles per second, which science says it is, nor does light travel at all. The light of incandescent suns is but an effect of one of the two equally opposed electric pressure conditions which interweave this universe into visible solids and liquids surrounded by invisible gases of space. 
These two opposite electric conditions which form the basis of the constitution of matter are the compressed condition of gravity pressure and the expanded condition of radiation pressure. These two electric conditions are the equal and opposite pressures which make motion imperative and without which motion is impossible. The positive electric condition compresses large volumes of light waves into small volumes by winding them up centripetally into spiral vortices by thrusting inward from without. This is what gravitation is. The negative electric condition expands small volumes of light waves into large volumes by unwinding them centrifugally into voiding equators where matter disappears. That is what radiation is. Radiation thrust outwardly from within to depolarize matter and void motion. The light of suns and the dark of space are but two opposite conditions of the same thing. They interchange constantly. Each becomes the other sequentially. Science excluded God from its consideration because of the supposition that God could not be proven to exist by laboratory methods. This decision is unfortunate, for God is provable by laboratory methods. The locatable, motionless light which man mistakenly calls magnetism is the invisible but familiar light which God is, and with it he controls his universe, as we shall see. Misconception of Electromagnetism 2. The Einstein theory of constitution of matter conceives this universe to be one great ocean of electromagnetism out of which and into which flow the streams of gravitation, matter, and energy. Radiation, the equal and opposite made of gravitation, without which gravitation is impossible, is entirely ignored in this fantastic and unnatural concept. Equally fantastic is the claim of this theory that it is possible to have gravitation without matter, and for space to exist without gravity or without matter. The weak point in this theory is the fact that electromagnetism is not an existent force in nature, nor are there electromagnetic fields or magnetic fields. Wave fields are electric, exclusively electric. Electricity is the only force which God makes use of to create this universe, and the only two tools God makes use of for creating his universe of matter and motion are two pairs of opposed spiral vortices. One of these opposite pairs meets at the apices at wave amplitudes to create spheres of matter, and the other opposed pair meets at cone bases upon wave axes to void both matter and motion. These two pairs of opposed electric spiral vortices are the basic units which construct all matter. Together they form the electric waves of motion which create the various pressure conditions which are needed to produce the many seemingly different elements of visible and invisible matter. Electricity is divided into two equal and opposite forces which thrust away from each other to build this polarized universe. When inability to thrust away from each other takes its sequential turn in the pulse of the universal heartbeat, Depolarization voids all opposition. Thus, this universe consists of cycles of life followed by death, growth followed by decay, and generation followed by radiation, each expressed simultaneously and repeated sequentially forever without end. That which science calls magnetism and believes to be a force which has the power of lifting tons of steel is God's still light, which balances and controls the equality of electric division. But electricity alone performs all of the work of this universe. The magnetic light which controls the universal balance performs no work whatsoever. A bar magnet 
picks up nails because of the electric current which divided that steel into its activated polarized conditions, and not because of its focal poles of silliness which center its two activities. Even though the electric current has been withdrawn, the steel retains its electric activity for long periods and acts as though the current still remained. Magnetic light control might be likened to the rudder of a ship, which controls the direction of the ship's motion, without in any way motivating that motion. It might again be likened to the fulcrum, which extends its power of expression through motion to a lever, without in any way activating to motivate that expressed motion of the lever. God's still magnetic light is the fulcrum of this creating universe. Electricity is the two-way lever, which extends from that fulcrum to give the universe its pulsing heartbeat of simulated life-death sequences. Wherever God's light appears in matter, there stillness centers motion. But there is no motion at that point. The center of gravity in a spherical sun or earth is one locatable point where God's light is. Likewise, the two still centers of north and south spiral vortices are other locatable balancing points of control. Likewise, the shaft, which connects all pairs of opposed poles, is an extension of stillness from the zero of wave beginnings to the zero of wave amplitudes and the return of motion to the zero of its beginnings in the stillness of its homing place on its wave axis. This is a universe of light at rest, from which two opposed lights of motion appear to manifest the idea which is eternally sealed in the light at rest. Misconception of Energy 3. Failure to recognize that this universal body of moving matter has been created by some power outside of itself has led science to conclude that the energy which created matter is within itself. Even more erroneous is the conclusion that energy is a condition of matter, such as heat. This fallacy has led to the conclusion that creation will disappear when heat energy runs down. The first and second laws of thermodynamics are built upon this obviously wrong conclusion. The universe will never run down. It is as eternal as God is eternal. This universe of matter in motion is a mind-conceived, mind-creating body. As such, it is as much a product of mind as a pair of shoes, a poem a symphony, or a tunnel under a mountain is a product of the mind which conceived it and motivated the action which produced it as a formed body of matter. The poem is not the poet, however, nor is the symphony its composer. In a like sense, this universe is not its own creator. Whatever qualities or attributes there are in any product, whether it be an adding machine or a universe, have been extended to that product by their creator to manifest qualities, attributes, and energies which are alone in the creator of that product. Nor is the idea which matter manifests within matter. Idea is never created. Idea is a mind quality. Idea never leaves the omniscient light of mind. Idea is but simulated by matter in motion. Idea never leaves its invisible state to become visible matter. Bodies which manifest idea are made in the image of their creator's imaginings. Every creation, whether of God or man, is an extension of its creator. It is projected from him by a force which is within its creator and not in the projected product. All of the knowledge, energy, and method of creating any product are properties of mind alone. There is no knowledge, energy, life, truth, intelligence, substance, or thought 
in the motion which matter is. Misconceptions of Matter 4. Electric matter is but a mirror which reflects qualities outside itself to simulate those qualities within itself. In the mind of any creator of any product is the idea of the form body which mind desires to produce. All the knowledge, energy, and method of production are in the mind of the creator of that product and not in the product. The architect does not say that the energy, idea, or construction methods are in the temple of his conceiving, nor should man say that they are in the temple of God's conceiving. To thus claim that energy is a property of matter is to deprive the creator of his omnipotence and omniscience. The entire universe manifests power, but the universe is not the power which it manifests. Not one particle of matter which constitutes the material body of any product can move of itself. It can only move through desire and command of the mind of its creator extended to it electrically. The powers of attraction and repulsion which science mistakenly attributes to matter are electrical effects performing their one and only function of dividing an equilibrium into two opposing conditions, which extend equally from a dividing equator. The magnetic light controls the balance of these two opposing conditions, which interchange two ways in their endeavor to void their opposing conditions. But the stresses and strains, which seem to make the matter attract and repel matter, are electric effects. Electric effects of motion can be insulated from each other, but the magnetic light of the creator which causes those effects cannot be insulated from matter by matter. All matter is electric. Electricity conditions all matter under the measured control of the one magnetic light, which forever balances the two electrically divided conditioned lights of matter and space. Divided matter strains to find balance in the zero of equilibrium from which it was divided. The senses of man are mightily deceived by the illusions of appearance, which cause him to conclude otherwise. Newton's apple was not attracted to the ground by gravitation. The high potential condition of that solid apple sought a similar high potential condition. That is to say, it fell toward the earth to fulfill nature's law of like seeking like. Had Newton sat with the apple for a week or two, he would have seen that same apple rise onto the heavens as a low potential gas seeking a like low potential position to balance its electrically divided state. The rising of the decaying Expanding apple again fulfills nature's law of like seeking like. All polarizing bodies add to their densities and potentials. The apple, which fell to the ground, was a polarized body. All polarized bodies must reverse their polarities and depolarize. They then lose their densities and potentials. The depolarized apple returned to the zero of its beginning. The Newtonian law is in this respect invalid because it accounts for but one half of the apple's growth decay cycle. This is a two-way universe of opposed effects of motion, not a one-way universe. Misconception of Substance in Matter 5. Sense of observation has led to the erroneous conclusion that there are 92 different substances of matter. This universe is substance-less. It consists of motion only. Motion stimulates substance by the control of its opposing wave pressures of motion, which deceive the senses into seeing substance where motion alone is. The senses do not reach beyond the illusion of motion. 
nor do those who believe that they can gain knowledge of the secrets of this vast make-believe universe even faintly comprehend the unreality of this mirage of polarized light in motion, which they so firmly believe is real. Motion is two-way, for all motion is caused by the division of an equilibrium and its extension in two opposite directions to create the two opposite conditions of pressures necessary to make motion imperative. One of these two conditions of electric motion thrust inward toward a center to create a centripetal vortice to stimulate gravity. On the other side of the dividing equator, the other condition thrust outward from a center to create a centrifugal vortice to stimulate vacuity. Moving waves of oppositely conditioned matter simulate substance, but there is no substance to the motion which simulates idea in matter. If a cobweb could move fast enough, it would simulate a solid steel disc, and it could cut through steel. If such a thing could happen, it would not be the substance of the cobweb which cut through the steel. It would be the motion which cut it. Fast-moving short waves simulate solids, while slow-moving long waves simulate gases of space which surround solids. Waves of motions are substanceless, however. They merely simulate substance. Motion itself is controlled by the mind of the Creator, who uses it to express His desire for simulating idea of mind by giving it a formed body. There is no other purpose for motion. Desire, in the light of mind for creative expression, is the only energy in this universe. All motion is mind-motivated. All motion records mind thoughts in matter. All matter is but pressure-conditioned motion. Varying pressure conditions yield varying states of motion. Varying states of motion are what science misinterprets as the elements of matter. Varying pressures in a wave are tonal. In each octave wave there are four pairs of tones each of which has the same relative position in its octave color spectrum as it has in its octaves of chemical elements. Waves are, therefore, electric, pressure-conditioned octaves of tones. The Secret of the Ages Part 1 Step by Simple Step I will briefly unfold the supreme mystery of all time to enable science to void the confusion which has arisen from its inability to relate the reality of the invisible universe to its simulation of reality, which has so regrettably deceived the senses of observers for all time. I do this not only for science, but for the great need of religion, which so sorely needs a God who can be known by all men as one to replace the many imagined concepts of God which have so disastrously disunited the human race. No one, save the few mystics of long ages, has ever known God or God's ways. Neither has mankind yet known the meaning of love upon which the universe is founded, nor of life, which the electric universe simulates in never-ending cycles nor of cause of the effects for which man so heavenly pays in tears and anguish for his not knowing, nor the constitution of matter, nor of God's invisible processes and the creation of pressures for conditioning matter. The long-heralded peace which passeth understanding awaits for science to tear away the veil which has so long hidden the face of the Creator. Religion can be united as one only by dispelling the ignorance which now cloaks the faith and belief God of fear which has bred so many intolerant groups of unknowing men. We speak familiarly about the spiritual, invisible mind universe of the Creator, and we speak with equal familiarity about the physical universe of matter which we call creation. 
but the world has not yet known either of them separately nor their unity as one to sufficiently define either of them scientifically. I will now do this as simply as possible in order that the physicist of tomorrow can know and comprehend the universe as one whole, instead of sensing it as many separate parts which you will never be able to fit together. 1. The Undivided Light The basis of creation is the light of the mind which created it. God is the light of mind. God's thinking mind is all there is. Mind is universal. Mind of God and mind of man are one. This eternally creating universe, which is God's eternally renewing body, is the product of mind knowing expressed through mind thinking. In the light of God's mind is all knowledge. All knowledge means full knowing of the Creator's one idea, which is manifested in His creation. The undivided and unconditioned light of mind is an eternal state of rest. That invisible light of the Spirit is the equilibrium of absolute balance and absolute stillness which is the foundation of the divided and pressure-conditioned universe of motion. In that light there is no change, no variance of condition, no form, and no motion. It is the zero universe of reality. In it are all of the mind qualities of knowledge, inspiration, power, love, truth, balance and law, which are never created, but are simulated in moving quantities in the divided universe of moving ways which we call matter. The light of mind is the zero fulcrum of the wave lever from which motion is projected. Its zero condition is eternal. The unfortunate error of science lies in assuming that the power which belongs solely to the fulcrum of light at rest is in the motion of the lever which simulates that power. 2. The Divided Light In the light of the Creator's mind is desire to dramatize his one idea by dividing its one unconditioned, unchanging unity of balance and rest into pairs of oppositely conditioned units which must forever interchange with each other to seek balance and rest. Desire then multiplies those pairs of units into an infinity of eternal repetitions to give formed bodies to the Creator's imaginings. All formed bodies are created in His image. Through the expression of desire and light, the universal drama of cause and effect is created as the product of mind knowing, divided by mind thinking. Cause is eternally at rest in the balanced unity of the undivided light. Cause is one. Effect is eternally in motion to seek balance and rest in the centering equilibrium of the two opposed lights of this divided universe, which it finds only to lose. Effect is two. The light of cause divided into the two opposed lights of effect is the one sole occupation of mind which we call thinking. Mind thinking sets divided idea into two-way opposed motion to produce the effect of simulating idea by giving form to it. Formed bodies are but pressure conditioned motion, however. They are not the idea which they simulate. 3. This electric universe of simulated idea 
Mind thinking is electric. Divided electric thought pulsations manifest creative desire in wave cycles of motion, which forever vibrate between the two electric thought conditions of concentration and decentration. Concentrative and decentrative sequences of electric thinking produce the opposed pressures of compression and expansion which form solid bodies of motion surrounded by gaseous space in one wave pulsation and reverse that order in the next. Concentrative thinking is centripetal. It focuses to a point. It borns gravity. It charges by multiplying low potential into high and cold into heat. Decentrative thinking is centrifugal. It expands into space. It borns radiation. It discharges by dividing high potential into low and heat into cold. All motion is a continuous two-way journey in opposite directions between two destinations. One destination is the apex of a cone in an incandescent center of gravity. At this point, motion comes to rest and reverses its direction. The other destination is the base of a cone encircling a cold evacuated center of radiation. At this point, motion again comes to rest and reverses its direction from centrifugal to centripetal. So long, as the Creator's mind divides his knowing by his thinking, just so long will that two way motion continue its sequences of cycles to record God's imaginings in forms of his imaginings. God being eternal, likewise, his universe is eternal. The belief of science that the universe had a beginning in some past remote period as the result of some giant cataclysm will come to an end in some future remote period is due to not knowing that waves of motion are the thought waves of the universal thinker. Also the belief of science that the universe is dying a heat death by the expansion of suns is due to not knowing that there are as many black evacuated holes in space for the reborning of suns as there are compressed suns for the reborning of evacuated black holes. Together, the interchange between these two conditions constitutes the heartbeat of the universe, and they are equal. Being equal, they are balanced and continuous eternally. The journey toward gravity simulates life, and the opposite journey simulates death in the forever repeating cycles which together in their continuity simulate eternal life. The two opposite pressure conditions which control the life-death cycles of all bodies are a. The negative condition of expansion which thrusts outward, radially and spirally from a centering zero of rest to form the low potential condition which constitutes space and b. The positive condition of compression, which thrust inward toward a centering zero of rest to form the compressed condition of gravity which generates forming bodies into solids surrounded by space. Desire of mind expresses its desire through the electric process of thinking. Thinking divides idea into pairs of oppositely conditioned units of motion which record a simulation of idea into thought forms. Sir James Jeans has suggested the possibility that matter might be proven to be pure thought. Matter is not pure thought, but it is the electric record of thought. Every electric wave is a recording instrument which is forever recording the form of thought in wave fields of matter. 
all thought waves created anywhere in any wave field become universal by repeating them everywhere. Thought waves of expanded and compressed states of motion are fashioned into moving patterns which simulate the forms of the Creator's imaginings. All formed bodies thus created are made in His image. This division of the undivided light and its extension into oppositely conditioned states of motion is the basis of the universal heartbeat of pulsing thought waves, which seemingly divide the one whole idea into many ones. Interchange between oppositely conditioned pairs of thought recording units is expressed in waves of motion. This is a thought wave universe. Thought waves are reproduced throughout the universe at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. It is commonly believed that the incandescence of suns is light. Incandescence simulates light in the cinema universe of macrocosmic make-believe. But incandescence is not light. It is but motion. Incandescence is merely the compressed half of the one divided pair of opposite conditions which constitute matter and space. The black vacuity of cold space constitutes the expanded half. Together, these two are as much mates as male and female are mates. Each is equally essential to the other. Each finds balance in the other by voiding each other's on balance. These two conditions and directions of compression and expansion are necessary for the two-way interchange of motion which performs the work of integrating and disintegrating the living-dying cycles of opposed motion, which is this electric universe. The incandescence of compressed matter and the black vacuity of expanded matter are the two opposite polar ends of nature's bar magnet. Nature does not make her bar magnets in the form of cylinders as man does. She makes them in the form of cones. In this radial universe, no other form of motion than the spiral form of cones is possible. This means that the negative end of nature's magnet is tens of thousands of times larger in volume than the positive end. Although the potentials of each end are equal, it also means that the equilibrium plane which divides nature's magnet is curved, while that same plane in a cylindrical bar magnet is a flat plane of zero curvature. 4. The Coulomb Law Misconception The Coulomb Law Statement that opposites attract and likes repel, is not true to natural law. Opposite conditions are opposite conditions. Likewise, there are opposite effects caused by each thrusting in opposite directions. It is not logical to say that opposites fulfill any other office than to oppose, nor is it logical to say that opposing things attract each other. In all this universe, like conditions seek like conditions. Gases and vapors seek gases and vapors by rising to find them. Liquids and solids seek liquids and solids by falling toward them. Radiating matter seeks a radiating condition in the outward direction of radiation. Gravitating matter seeks the inward radial direction of condensation to find its like condition. Opposite poles of a bar magnet thrust away from each other as far as they can go. That is the very purpose of the electric current which divides the universal equilibrium. If opposite poles attracted each other, they would have to be together in the middle instead of pushing away from each other to the very ends. When depolarization takes place, the poles seem to draw closer together, 
but that is because of their lessening vitality. They still thrust away from each other until devitalization is complete. When motion ceases, the matter which manifests ceases to be. Scientific observers have been deceived by their senses in thinking that opposites attract each other because of seeing the north pole of one magnet pull toward the south pole of another magnet. The fact that opposite polarities void each other when thus contacted has not been considered as a factor in the matter. It is a fact, however, when two opposites are thus brought together by their seeming eagerness to contact each other, both poles cease to be. Each one has voided the other as completely as the chemical opposites sodium and chlorine void each other and leave no trace of either one after that contact. If the Coulomb law were valid, it would not be possible to gather together one ounce of any one element. 5. This electric universe or simulated energy in order to know more dynamically what electricity really is, I will define it. I will then amplify my definition by example. Electricity is an effect of strain, tension, and resistance caused by the energy of desire and the light of mind to divide and extend the balanced unity of the one still light of universal mind into pairs of many divided units of thinking mind. And when electric strains and tensions cease to oppose each other, electricity ceases to be. Electricity is a dual action reaction. When dual action reactions cease to vibrate, electric effect is voided by the one universal condition of rest. Sound vibrations of a harp string are an electrical effect. The electrical vibrations of sound are a division of undivided silence. When sound vibrations cease, silence has swallowed them up by voiding them. The idea of the silent harp string note eternally exists. Electrical division into sound manifests the idea. But the idea belongs to silence and to silence it returns for reborning again as a simulation of idea. The two electric pressures formed by the division of the universal equilibrium have separate offices to fulfill. The negative pressure expands to create space by dividing potential and multiplying volume. Conversely, the positive pressure contracts to multiply potential into solids by dividing volume. Electricity thus performs the work of the world by straining toward separateness and multiplicity of units, and also by relaxing from such resisted strains and tensions until motion ceases its vibrations by withdrawing into the universal stillness. The only work performed in this universe is the work caused by the strains and tensions of electrically divided matter in motion. Matter moves only to seek rest and balance. Matter neither repels nor attracts matter. All matter which is out of balance with its environment, volume for volume or potential for potential, will move only to seek rest and an equipotential environment of equal volume displacement. That is why air or ocean currents move, and for no other reason than to seek their lost equilibrium. And while they move, they will perform work. And the measure of their power to perform work is the measure of their unbalance. Earth's tides are not pulled by the moon. Curvature in the pressures of their wave fields which control their balance is the cause of that. And that explains why tides are thrust away from the face of the earth opposite to that of the moon, as well as being thrust toward the moon on its near face. When tides rise, they will perform work. And they will also perform work when they fall. But work will cease being performed the moment the motion of either rising or falling ceases. 
Likewise, a waterfall will perform work, while falling but not when water cease to move. A storage battery will perform work while being charged with increasingly high potential pressures, which oppose each other, and it will perform an equal amount while it is discharging to seek the equilibrium pressure which will unite the divided two. When fully discharged, it will cease performing work, because it has found balance in its zero and can no longer move. In a live electric battery, or in its chemical counterparts such as sodium and chlorine, there are three equators, the central dividing one being the fulcrum of the two extended ones. When the two extended equators of the live electric battery withdraw into their balancing one, the battery is dead. They have found their eternal stillness. Likewise, their chemical counterparts have ceased to exist as separate elements when they withdraw into their sodium chloride fulcrum. Even though sodium and chlorine have disappeared, they still are, for they will as surely reappear as night will follow day. To recharge the battery, the one dividing equator has to be extended in opposite directions until there are again three before motion is possible. Motion is not only possible, but imperative. The heartbeat of the universe is eternal. So long as the universal heartbeat continues, every divided pair and every unit of every divided pair will reappear to express life as surely as it will again disappear in eternal repetitions to express death. Work is not performed by the attraction of matter for matter nor because of a condition of matter such as heat, which is presumed to be energy. Work is performed solely because the electric current, which divides a motionless condition into two unbalanced conditions, sets up two oppositely straining tensions of unrest which must move to release those tensions. 6. The Duality of Electric effect. No effect can be produced unless there is an equal opposite effect to work with it. Electrical workers are two which move in opposite directions to perform that effect called work. Effect is therefore two-way, just as work is performed two ways. The two electrical workers are like two men on opposite ends of a double saw which pull and thrust in opposite directions from opposite ends to perform the work of sawing down a tree. Or they are like two compression and expansion ends of a piston which pull and thrust in opposite directions sequentially to move and to perform work while they move in either opposed direction. Each end of the saw or piston is helpless without the other. Heat, for example, is one end of the cosmic piston. Cold is the other end. Just so long as these two conditions exist, the piston of interchanging motion will continue to expand and contract sequentially. When each has found equilibrium by voiding the other, motion will immediately cease and work can no longer be performed. Science says that cold is less heat. One might as appropriately say that female is less male, or that south is less north. Science also says that there is no compensating uphill flow of energy to balance its downhill flow. There is an uphill flow, otherwise a downhill flow would be impossible. Every wave is a compression expansion pump. The whole universe is a giant pump. The two-way piston of the universal pump constitutes the universal heartbeat. A one-way universe is as impossible as a one-way pump is impossible. The compressed condition of this universe is exactly equal to the expanded condition. The compressed condition is gravitation. The expanded condition is radiation. Gravitation and radiation are equal opposites. Each is helpless 
without the other. In fact, each condition is impossible to produce without simultaneously producing the other. Heat is the effect of multiplied resistance to the compression of gravitation. Cold is the effect of the opposite strain of resistance to evacuation or emptiness, which results from the expansion of radiation. There is as much cold in the great expanses of space as there is heat in the compressed suns in all of this universe. There is not one ampere of difference between these two opposite conditions of electric workers in the whole universe. Or is there one milligram of weight in it which is not balanced between the two? This universe of electric waves is divided into wave fields. Each wave field is equally divided by contraction of gravitation and expansion of radiation. The potential of solids in a wave field is equally compensated by the potential of space which surrounds the solids. It is as impossible to unequalize these two conditions in any wave field or produce either one of them separately without simultaneously producing the other as it would be to polarize one end of a bar magnet without producing an equal pole of opposition at the other end. This wave universe is divided into wave fields. Each wave field is an electric battery which is forever being charged by the centripetal polarizing power of gravitation and discharged by the centrifugal depolarizing power of radiation. This process is a manifestation of the life-death, growth-decay principle which is ever-present in every effect of motion in nature, without exception. Together they constitute the electric action-reaction sequences without which there would be no universe. It is not true to nature, therefore, to say that either heat, cold, compression, expansion, or any other expression of motion is energy. If the power to cause motion is in the balanced state of rest, it necessarily follows that energy is in the stillness of rest and not in the motion, which is effect of cause. The mind of the Creator is the fulcrum from which the wave lever of mind thinking extends to express the energy of creative mind. Thought waves cannot, therefore, be the energy which caused them to become thought waves. Any lever is powerless without a fulcrum. The power to move lies in the fulcrum, which never moves. All motion starts from a point of rest, seeks a point of rest and returns in the reverse direction to its starting point of rest. Test this fact by throwing a ball in the air, breathing in and out, and pulling a chain or walking. Electrical effects of motion are not energy. Matter in motion is a marionette on the end of two mind-controlled electric strings. 7. What is the work of this universe? The only work performed in this universe is the work of recording thought forms of mind imaginings into positively charging bodies which are expressing the vitalizing half of the life-death cycle of creating bodies and into negatively discharging bodies, which are expressing the devitalizing other half of that cycle. That is the only work there is to do in all creation, for God records his concentrative decentrative thinking and the electric actions, reactions, of living, dying bodies, which appear and disappear in sequential cycles. Creation of bodies is the only work that man does. Every body created by God or man appears from invisible stillness and disappears into that same stillness of its source to reappear periodically in life-death growth decay cycles forever. All bodies manifest eternally eternal idea by eternally repeating their manifestations of idea in continuous cycles, 
which have no beginnings or endings. To exemplify, cold generates, generation contracts, contraction heats, heat radiates, radiation expands, and expansion cools. Sound, for example, is a body of interchanging motion which appears from a silent harp string and returns to it. The silent harp string is the fulcrum of energy from which the moving harp string extends as a vibrating lever of motion to manifest the idea of a musical tone in life-death cycles. 8. This polarized, sex-conditioned, pulsing, thought-wave universe. Science has for years been searching for some simple underlying basic principle of motivation, which is present in every effect of motion. Mathematicians have hoped to find it and reduce it to a basic formula. Physicists have sought for it in the hope of thus discovering the life principle. Science has never found it, and never will find it so long as it is sought for in either matter or motion. That elusive secret is to be found only in the zero light of the universal equilibrium, which is the fulcrum of the sex-divided electrical universe of thought waves of two-way motion. That forever hidden secret of the ages is the divider of the one zero into a seeming two extended zeros and it is the multiplier of the two into countless twos. The name of that great divider of rest into two-way electric motion is polarity. Polarity is the controller, the measurer, and the surveyor of electric intensity of desire in mind for the actions, reactions, needed for creative expression. Polarity extends its surveyed measure of desire from a zero point of rest in the universal light to two extended zero points of rest where motion reverses its direction, its polarity, and its condition. These two points of stillness where electric motion reverses from one opposite pressure condition to the other are what science calls magnetic poles. The office of magnetic poles is to balance and control all electrically divided motion in the universe. All electrically divided matter, whether atom or giant sun, is controlled by a still centering point of magnetic light. The two extended poles of that still light measure the intensity of desire, which motivates those extensions from their source of energy in the still light. Electricity vitalizes and devitalizes, charges and discharges, gravitates and radiates, in-breathes and out-breathes, lives and dies, appears and disappears, compresses and expands, heats and cools, grows and decays, integrates and disintegrates, and solidifies and vaporizes by its electric actions reactions which divide the one into countless pairs of separate ones under polar control. When man breathes in, he polarizes his body. He vitalizes it into wakeful action and an awareness of sensation. He charges his body with higher electrical potential. He manifests life. When man breathes out, he depolarizes his body. He devitalizes it into sleepy inaction and lessening awareness of sensation. He discharges his body by lowering its potential. He manifests death. 9. Polarity periodicity is the basis of the constitution of matter. Nature is engaged in the making of but one form. The cube sphere, which means the same as though we said female male of man. The sphere is the positive centering sun. The cube is the invisible surrounding wave field. All matter 
is thus divided into positive solids surrounded by negative space. As matter begins its formation into spheres, its first shape is disc-like, for it begins as the base of a cone. In a series of efforts which constitute the octave wave, the first disc-like effort gradually prolates until the perfect sphere is formed at wave amplitude. This is the process by means of which matter emerges from space. During this process, the balance poles which control all matter move gradually toward the pole of rotation. When the sphere is perfected, as it finally is at carbon, the two poles coincide with the pole of rotation, and the equator of the perfected sphere is 90 degrees from the wave's axis. Likewise, the wave field becomes a true cube. Likewise, any element which has reached its true sphere status will crystallize as a true cube. Likewise, any divided pairs of elements which unite as one on wave amplitude, such as sodium and chlorine, will crystallize in the true cube shape of its wave field. Conversely, as true spheres ablate, the two balancing poles move away from the pole of rotation and toward the wave axis, until depolarization is completed and magnetic poles disappear in the plane of the wave axis. This is the manner in which space swallows up matter. The mechanics of this process of polarization and depolarization, under the guiding control of two pairs of magnetic poles, will be more fully described later. This electric process of polarization takes place with increasing intensity for one half of every cycle, whether of one breath, the cycle of a day, a year, or a lifetime. A man of 40 will have reached his fully polarized strength to manifest life in the first half of his life-death cycle. Depolarization then assumes control as polarity reverses at the wave amplitude of man's life cycle. Devitalization then begins, and from there on, man manifests the death half of the cycle. This process takes place in every creating particle of matter or any combination of particles, whether in man, ant, electron, or nebula. As polarization increases in intensity, the strains and tensions set up by the desire of opposites of polarity to pull away from each other increase in their intensity. This fact is exactly the opposite effect from the conclusion stated in Coulomb's law. As polarization decreases, the strains and tensions of electric opposition relax until polarity entirely disappears and the rest condition of the equal potential plane of the wave axis. This fact should not be interpreted as electric opposites attracting each other, for depolarization means that the ability to oppose lessens as each pole voids the other in the rest condition, but they still thrust away from each other until their end. The entire process of polarization and depolarization of every action-reaction of nature could well be described as a lever reaching out in opposite directions from its fulcrum until it could reach no farther, then reversing those directions and unwillingly withdrawing into its fulcrum, where motion ceases to again begin and again reverse. 10. So-called Magnetic Lines of Force One of the great illusions of nature which has deceived scientific observers is the principle of curvature is everywhere present in ever-changing effect in every wave field, and in wave fields within wave fields throughout the universe. Wave fields are bounded by planes of zero curvature, which acts as mirrors to reverse all radiation which reaches out to these wave field boundaries. An example of such a plane of zero curvature is the equator of a bar magnet. Iron fillings reaching out from either pole will curve gradually in the ever-changing pressure gradients which surround the poles. Science mistakenly calls these curved lines 
magnetic lines of force. When these curved lines reach the equator, which divides the two poles, they reverse and repeat their curvature as though reflected by a mirror. There are no magnetic lines of force in nature. These so-called curved lines are the radii of the spheres and spheroids, which constitute this radial universe of prolating and ablating matter. Radiation is an electric effect. It is not magnetic. Pressures which surround spheres and spheroids vary greatly in their equipotential pressure gradients. As radiation is maximum at solar or planetary equators, and gravitation is maximum at their poles. The pressure gradients surrounding spheres or spheroids vary in their curvature to conform to these pressures. Gravitation and radiation are both radial. Radii of either the inward direction of gravity or the outward direction of radiation cannot be projected through varying pressures without bending to conform to the varying densities of varying pressure gradients. Just as a stick, when thrust into water, seems to suddenly break at the dividing plane of the two different densities, so likewise do the radii of incoming and outgoing light rays seemingly bend gradually as pressures gradually become more or less dense. This divided universe is curved. Its two opposed conditions of gravitation and radiation are oppositely curved. Each has a system of curvature of its own, and each system is opposed to the other for their purposes are opposed. The system of gravity curvature is evidenced in spheroidal and ellipsoidal layer of equal potential pressure gradients which curve around gravity centers. The surface of the Earth and heavy side layers are good examples. The curvature of gravitation is centripetal. It is controlled by the north-south magnetic poles. Its office is to extend bodies in motion from their wave axes to their wave amplitudes. The system of radial curvature is evidenced in ellipsoidal layers of equipotential pressure gradients, which extend radially away from gravity centers. Radial curvature has the same relation to equators of suns and planets as gravity curvature has to their poles of rotation. Good examples of radial curvature are the rings of Saturn, the Dumbbell Nebula. The system of radial curvature is centrifugal. It is controlled by two as yet unknown magnetic poles, which will be amply described later as east-west poles. The interrelations of these pairs of poles are more fully set forth in Chapter 21. The entire matter of curvature is one of the many optical illusions which nature is completely made up of. Curved pressure gradients act as lenses to bend radiating light outward as they pass through their concavity from an inward to an outward direction. The reverse takes place as gravitating rays pass through the convexity of light lenses from the outward to the inward direction. Polarity surveys and measures these pressures, but electricity alone projects and retracts the light which causes these illusions. The supposition that magnetism is a mysterious force of some kind which attracts and repels has helped to build these wrong conclusions which the senses have deceived observers into believing. In our home study course, we have very carefully and plainly diagrammed the principle of two-way curvature within wave fields, and the principle of zero curvature which bounds wave fields and insulates the effect of one wave field from every other by a principle of reversals. So we must let this brief description suffice for the purpose of this treatise. 11. The Inadequate Law of Conservation of Energy The law says that the amount of energy in the universe is constant. That is true, because energy is unchanging in the undivided light at rest. But the scientific meaning back of that true law is not nature's meaning. 
Energy belongs to the invisible universe. It is extended into the visible universe of motion only from a fulcrum which is at rest. The energy, however, does not pass beyond the fulcrum into matter or condition of matter or motion of matter. That which passes beyond rest into motion is an expression of energy, a simulation of energy, an effect projected from a cause to demonstrate what energy can do when projected into the illusions of motion. Energy thus expressed might be likened unto the countless actions of a motion picture. The motion thus expressed simulates the energy and the idea which has been projected from an undivided mental source through a divided electric wave source by the way of a fulcrum zero upon which the wave oscillates. It cannot be said, therefore, that the energy simulated by the motion picture is in the picture rather than in the source of the picture. Likewise, the same cannot be said of nature's cosmic cinema motion picture of cause and effect, which the master playwright has projected upon the screen of space from the light of his knowing through the light lenses of his electric thinking. To prove that the scientific meaning of the truly stated law is not nature's meaning, I will quote from a science textbook which explains the meaning of the law as follows. This law means that if energy appears in one form, it must have disappeared from another in corresponding amount. The words appears and disappears indicate that energy is meant to be actually within the visible motion and not in its fulcrum. 12. Thermodynamic Misconception If polarity has been rightly understood by science, the thermodynamic laws and accepted principles would never have been written. Clausius originally wrote the second law of thermodynamics as follows. It is impossible for a self-acting machine to convey heat from one body to another at a higher temperature. This is not true, for nature is constantly doing just that thing in every expression of gravity. Every cold body of rain or snow heats as it falls to earth and conveys that heat to lift the higher temperature of the earth to a still higher temperature. Every cold body which is added by gravity to a larger body at higher temperature raises the temperature of both bodies by the added crushing, compressing weight of gravity. It is the office of gravity to compress, and it is the office of compression to heat, and it is the office of heat to throw off its hot bodies so that they may cool in return as contracting bodies to again heat. Every cold body which approaches a larger body charges both bodies. Charging bodies heat. Conversely, every body which radiates from a larger body discharges both bodies. Discharging bodies cool. The cold of space heats hot suns hotter by the way of their poles, and hot suns radiate their heat by way of their equators to form cooling rings, which again heat to become hot planets. The law is further explained by stating that an object will fall of its own accord from a higher to a lower level, but it will not rise of its own from a lower level to a higher level. This is also not true. Everything which falls toward one of the two polarized conditions of matter must rise toward the other opposite condition. The interchange is equal. The apple which falls of its own accord, rises of its own accord. Water unites its particles into closer relationship in order to fall, then divides in more remote relationship in order to rise. Everything which emerges from space by the way of gravity is swallowed up by space by the way of radiation. 
This is as true of suns as it is of apples. Every sun which is projected into space by one swing of polarity's pendulum has its mate in a black, vacuous hole of equal potential on the other side of its wave axis, which is waiting to swallow it up when the pendulum reverses its swing. The confusion of observers who conceived that law is due to their not knowing of the balance of nature which polarity controls. They think of the apple as a heavy object which cannot rise as a heavy object. The layman thinks objectively of an apple as a solid object, but the scientist should think of the apple as one fleeting part of a whole cycle. The solid apple is that part of its cycle which has condensed from a large volume to become a small volume located at the apex of its spiral cone cycle. Scientists should think cyclically and not objectively. The apex of a cone which one objectively thinks of as an apple will expand to become the base of a cone which will eventually spiral in its apex on the bough of some tree to again become an apple. This is not an objective universe. It is cyclic. Objectivity is but one stage of a cycle which is forever moving through many stages between the appearance and disappearance of what the senses interpret as objective. The astronomer should likewise think that way of his suns and stars. It should be easier for the astronomer to think cyclically than for the physicist, for he can see his cone apices expand into cone bases for rewinding into new suns, in the same manner that apples expand to become cone bases for rewinding into objective apple forms at cone apices. Had Newton thought that way in relation to an apple, he would not have written such an inadequate, unnatural, and misleading law. Scientists should not think of sequential effects only, but should also think of the simultaneous workings of all two-way expressions. This is how nature works. As the solid apple falls, an equal potential simultaneously rises. If I put my hand in water, an equal amount to that which is displaced by my hand rises. As the apple falls, it simultaneously charges the earth and discharges space. When the apple rises, it simultaneously charges space and discharges the earth. The balance and potential between gravitating matter and radiating matter in every wave field, is absolute. Scientific observers have never thought of it that way. They have not thought of space as being divided into definitely measured compartments, such as wave fields. The more evacuated space there is in a wave field, the more solid is the matter which centers it and the greater the volume of space. As space cools more, and its wave fields expand more in volume, its central sun equally contracts and heats. Polarity divides all of its electric effects equally. The volume of negative space may be thousands or millions of times greater than the volume of its positive center, but their potentials are equal to the millionth of an ampere. If this were not so, the Kepler law which says that equal areas in a radius vector are covered in equal time, would not be workable. Nor would the cube ratios of acceleration and deceleration work out. 13. Inadequacy and Fallacy of Newton's Three Laws and One Hypothesis The Newton Laws and Hypothesis seem to be a master statement of nature's underlying principles. They have held their prestige with reverence for their validity for 300 years, during which time the misconception that all matter attracts all matter with mathematically measurable power has been a fundamental of scientific thinking. New enlightenment as to God's ways and processes will demonstrate that this belief is but one more of the many seemingly obvious facts of nature which deceive the senses into forming wrong conclusions. 
The senses of man have too readily accepted these simulations of facts for real facts. Newton's first law says, Every body tends to continue in its state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless it is acted upon by an outside force. This law was written to fit non-existent premises which were mistakenly presumed to exist. A body cannot continue its state of rest because bodies at rest do not exist in nature. Bodies are but waves of motion. When motion ceases, bodies cease to be. One might as appropriately refer to sound being at rest in silence, for sound is matter in motion, like all other bodies. A body cannot continue its uniform motion in a straight line in this radial universe of curved pressure gradients. Such a phenomenon is impossible. Likewise, all bodies are continually being acted upon by two outside forces, opposed forces, not one intermittent force. Every body in the universe is constantly in violent motion, even though it simulates rest. When motion ceases, matter ceases. A cloud floating motionlessly above the earth is moving at a speed of a thousand miles per hour as the earth rotates. It is also moving violently in all of its parts. It is also moving in a curved line of direction, not a straight line, even though the force acting upon it is unchanging. The same thing may be said of airplanes, planets, moons, or radio waves. They all follow the curvature of gravity pressure gradients because gravity is always curved. Even the lead pencil lying motionlessly upon a table cannot simulate rest except through motion so violent that your entire house would be instantly destroyed if the dual forces which cause that motion suddenly withdrew their support of it. I herewith offer the following laws which have meaning in nature to replace this meaningless first law. 1. All motion in this polarized radial universe is curved, and all curvature is spiral. 2. Every body is the result of the exertion of two opposing strains which thrust away from each other in opposite radial directions to condition its attributes and determine its motion. 3. Every body is perpetually in motion until the strains of opposition which keep it in motion void each other, and the universal zero of rest, in which all bodies disappear for reappearance and reverse polarity. Newton's third law says, To every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This law is inadequate and incomplete, for it confuses the facts which govern motion. Just what does it mean? Had it been written in either of the two following ways, the confusion as to its meaning would disappear, but either one would still be incomplete. 1. To every action there is an equal and opposite simultaneous reaction, or 2. To every action there is an equal and opposite sequential reaction. The inference is that the latter meaning was Newton's intent. To rewrite this law in conformity with nature's processes, Newton's third law should read as follows. Every action is simultaneously balanced by an equal and opposite reaction and is repeated sequentially in reversed polarity. That the above may be better understood by the scientist whose traditional training has fixed within his consciousness the one-way universe concept it would be well for me to give a few familiar examples of the fundamental principle of the two-way concept, which operates in every action-reaction effect of motion, without exception, anywhere. 1. An outward explosion compresses in advance of the direction of the action and simultaneously evacuates in the opposite direction. The following half of the cycle is in reverse. The evacuated condition becomes a compressed one, 
and the compressed condition becomes an evacuated one. No better example of polarity than the above could be cited. An electric division of the indivisible equilibrium into pairs of opposite conditions takes place in this manner. And the only two conditions in the universe are the compressed plus and the expanded minus conditions, and there result in effects of heat and cold, male and female, positive and negative, and other wave vibrating pairs of opposites. 2. The discharge of a revolver and its recoil are simultaneous. The sequential reaction is in reverse. That which was a discharge becomes a charge, and their directions are reversed. That which was evacuated becomes a force of gravity, which compresses at its center instead of around its circumference. The concavity of outward pressures reverses to the convexity of inward pressures. Curvature of every simultaneous action-reaction is the reverse of the sequential one. 3. The discharge of every out-breathing body, whether man or sun or electron, charges space by compressing it and simultaneously discharges the body by expanding it. The sequential action-reaction of in-breathing reverses this process. Likewise, evacuating bodies simultaneously compress, and compressing space simultaneously expands its wave field boundaries to balance each opposite with the other. Every outward action is an explosion which forms rings of compression at its equator. These surround a large volume of expanded space. The sequential inward reaction of this action forms a center of gravity within the expanded biome as a nucleus for a forming sphere. Every sphere thus formed explodes radially to form rings of compression at its equator which again become sphere systems. These are the fundamentals of the constitution of matter. This underlying process of nature is present in its every action-reaction. It is the very mechanics of the universal in-breathing and out-breathing process of nature which motivates the heartbeat of the universe. It is the inside-out, outside-in turnings of space and matter which swallow each other up to born each other sequentially. This process is nature's most conspicuous fundamental. Repetition in nature is due to this process. 4. Every growing thing which unfolds from the invisible pattern of its seed into visible form simultaneously refolds within its seed as an invisible record of the pattern of the unfolding form. The sequential reaction reverses the inward refolding direction and repeats the outward unfolding direction of growth. Newton's hypothesis states as follows. Every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle with a force that varies directly as the product of the masses and inversely as the square of the distance. Science states that Newton's mathematics prove without question that matter attracts matter. This is not true. Mathematics may prove the measures and relationships of a mirage, but they do not prove that the railroad tracks do meet there. Likewise, Newton's mathematics may prove the rates of acceleration and deceleration of the opposing pressures of gravity and radiation, as masses move toward and recede from each other and their eagerness to find rest from strains and tensions of unbalance. But that does not prove that matter attracts matter. It only proves that matter seems to attract matter. Just as railroad tracks seem to meet upon the horizon. It would be just as logical to assert that planets were attracted by their perihelia because it would be mathematically proven that all planets increase their speed as they approach their perihelia. For Newton's third law to be valid, it must apply to all motions such as the orbits of planets as well as to falling bodies such as the apple, which is claimed to fall because it is attracted to the earth. It must have no exceptions 
and it has many. Let us consider one of them. When the apple falls towards a center of gravity, Newton adds up the product of these two masses, apple and earth, and mathematically accounts for the rate of acceleration as the two mutually attracting bodies approach each other. When a planet approaches its perihelion, however, its speed increases just as the speed of the falling apple increases. Unlike the apple which is approaching another body, however, the planet is but approaching an empty point in space, where there is no other body to add to that of the planet, such as there is when planet and apple potentials can be totaled. The planet accelerates, however, without having another body to attract it. Why has not this most obvious fact been observed long ago? Let us look at this law from another point of view. Science has founded its cosmogenetic theory upon its belief that this is a one-way, discontinuous, non-compensating universe, in spite of the very obvious continuous compensating two-way universe manifested in all of its effects, without one single exception in all nature. Whenever nature projects any wave lever from its still fulcrum, she projects it to opposite ways, simultaneously, then reverses both by withdrawing both lever extensions back into their fulcrum. This fulfills her invariable law, which decrees that all motion is born from rest, seeks two opposing points of maturity to rest, then returns as death to the zero of its beginning for rebirth. Misconceptions of Weight all freely floating bodies which are in balance with their environment have no weight whatsoever. The moment any potential is taken out of an environment of equal potential, electric strains and tensions are set up in the unbalanced mass, thus removed, which measure the resistance to that removal. A stone, for example, is very much out of balance with an equal volume of air. The stone will fall to seek a like potential, not because it has weight as a property of itself, but because of the strains of electric polarity, which divide the universal balance into equal and opposite unbalanced pairs, and insist upon keeping the universe in balance. Science believes that a man who weighs 150 pounds while surrounded by air still weighs 150 pounds when surrounded by the entirely different pressures of water in which he floats. That is not a true concept. When a man is surrounded by air, he is out of balance with polarity which divides pressures equally. Electric tensions then act as elastic bands which are sufficiently stretched to register a strain of a hundred and fifty pounds pull against the zero of his balance. When he is surrounded by water, however, the pressures of displacement and replacement are equalized. Each is in balance with the other, and weight disappears. If weight were a fixed attribute of matter, it would be unchangeable. It varies, however, as the potentials of masses out of balance vary. A man weighs less as he ascends a mountain and more in a deep pit. As water falls, it compresses and gains in potential. As it rises, it divides into vapors and loses potential. It therefore weighs less. When its potential is equal in volume to the volume of potential displaced, it floats as a cloud. It then has no weight. And so it is with stars, suns, planets, and moons. They are all freely floating bodies and have no weight in respect to any other body in the universe. Each solid centers an oppositely polarized volume of space in a wave field in which each polarized condition is of equal potential but of unequal volume. Every balanced wave field is insulated from every other wave field by reversals of curvature, which are separately considered in later pages. The following definitions of weight will help to clarify the present misconception regarding it. 1. 
Weight is the measure of unbalance between the two electric forces which polarize the universal equilibrium. 2. Weight is the sum of the difference between the two pressures which act on every mass. 3. Weight is the sum of the difference in electric potential between any mass and the volume it occupies. 4. Weight is the measure of the force which a body exerts in seeking its true potential. 5. Weight is the sum of the difference between the inward thrust of gravitation and the outward thrust of radiation. Regarding initial impulse, the movement of planets around their suns and of the moons around their planets has always been an unexplained mystery. In ancient days, even up to the 16th century, it was commonly believed that angels pushed the planets around in their orbits. It is today quite commonly believed that at the time of the creation of this universe, an initial impulse was given to each planet and moon, which was just sufficient to keep each one forever moving around its primary. The slightest understanding of the nature of the electric current and its mechanical process of dividing one condition of eternal balance into two opposed conditions of unbalance would dissipate such a belief. There are countless billions of suns, earths, and moons in the heavens. It could not just happen that each of these has just the right initial velocity to keep it in its orbit as a result of the primal cataclysm which is credited with the birth of the universe. That would be too great a cosmic coincidence for acceptance by any reasoning person. Also, such a theory would not bear the weight of so great a disturbing factor of this belief as the fact that no speed of any solar body is constant as it would have to be to give substance to such a claim. Every solar body is forever and constantly varying its speed around its primary. It varies in its revolution by going faster for one half and slower for the other half. It also varies it over its millions of years of motion by gradually slowing its speed of revolution and increasing its speed of rotation as it spirals away from its primary. During these periods, not one of the billions of solar bodies ever goes fast enough to fly off as a tangent from its primary, nor slow enough to fall into it, which in any case could not happen regardless of speed. In addition to the foregoing is the fact that there never has been a primal cataclysm which created the universe. Electricity does not work that way and there is no other working force in this universe than the dual electric force. Electricity expresses its dividing powers equally and simultaneously. Electricity then grows her effects to maturity and takes them apart to repeat them sequentially. Also, there have been millions of generations of suns just as there have been millions of generations of men. If the initial impulse theory has any merit, that merit would not apply to descendants ten times ten billion generations removed. Our moon is not one minute old in cosmic time. It could therefore have no initial impulse. This is a radial universe, and every center of gravity in every solar body is the apex of a conic section. Every satellite of every such body is a radial projection from the equator of its primary. It first appears as a ring thrown off centrifugally from its parent's equator. The ring becomes a sphere which centers its own wave field within its ancestor wave fields, then continues its outward spiral journey for millions of years of ever slowing speed and ever changing potential to keep in balance with the ever-changing potential of its wave field. Our solar system is a good example. Consider Mercury as the latest extension of our Sun. It is a very hot and very compressed planet which speeds around its primary in less than three months. When Mercury spirals out to where our Earth is, it will take four times as long to make one revolution 
and he will be about four times as large in volume, for it must gradually expand to keep in balance with the ever-changing equal potential layers of the pressure gradient, which reaches out from the sun into space. When Mercury attains the position of Jupiter, it will be many times larger, and its period of revolution will be many years. Also, its period of rotation will speed up as its period of revolution slows down, in order that the centripetal and centrifugal effects of polarization will keep their balance with each other. Likewise, the inner moon of Mars circles its primary every seven hours, while the outer moon takes 30 hours. All orbits are elliptical, for they are angular conic sections. Likewise, all are either centripetal or centrifugal spirals, because their paths are either in the direction of the apex or the base of a cone. Contradiction in the centripetal direction accounts for increase of speed as planets approach their perihelia, and expansion in the direction of a conical base accounts for decrease in speed of revolution of outer planets, and also for decrease in speed as planets approach there. Apahelia. In view of all such very orderly periodicities and processes in the formation of material systems, it seems incredible that a formula such as Newton's hypothesis ever should be thought of as a proof that matter attracts matter, or that initial impulse accounted for the speed of planetary revolution. The Two Ways of Life and Death Nature projects or extends its wave lever for one half of its cycle to manifest the life and growth principle. That is the process of polarization. Polarization vitalizes bodies by dividing their zero condition of rest and extending the divided pairs away from their zero equator as far as they can go. Polarization thrust inwardly in centripetal spirals. It contracts to create gravity. Nature then withdraws its wave lever into a zero source to manifest the death and decay principle during the other half of every cycle. That is the process of depolarization. Depolarization devitalizes bodies by voiding the desire of the divided conditions to oppose each other. It relaxes the strains and tensions of electric opposition. Depolarization thrust outwardly in centrifugal spirals. It expands to radiate every generated body back into the zero of its source in order that death may reverse its manifestation and reappear as life. Matter appears when polarization divides an equilibrium zero into two zeros of opposite polarity. Matter then disappears when the divided and opposed poles unite to rest in the eternal one zero of the still light from which all things appear and into which they disappear for the purpose of reappearing in eternal sequences. What are life and death? That which man calls life in bodies is accelerative motion only, the centripetal motion of interchanging wave vibrations between two poles which have been extended from the one of their source. It is the accelerative motion of centripetal force which generates and contracts. Science has long been searching for the life principle in some germ of matter. It may as well cast nets in the sea to search for oxygen. That which is called death is just the opposite half of the whole life cycle. It is the decelerative motion of centrifugal force which degenerates, decays, and expands. Even though all bodies are both living and dying in each breath sequence of their whole cycle, the generative force of polarization is stronger in the first half of the cycle. Conversely, all dying bodies are living while they die. But the degenerative force of depolarization which devitalizes is the stronger in the second half. Life 
is eternal. There is no death. Life is but simulated in matter by polarization, depolarization sequences, as all idea of mind is but simulated in thought waves of moving matter. We now return to Newton's one-way laws and one-way mathematics. Newton's one-way laws and hypothesis account for falling bodies which are within the same wave field and as a consequence have weight in respect to their common centers of gravity. Falling bodies are polarizing bodies. They gain weight as they fall. Newton's laws do not account, however, for rising bodies which have reversed their polarities and lose their weight as they rise. Neither do they account for floating bodies such as suns, planets of moons, which center their own wave fields and as a consequence have no weight in respect to any other body in the universe. Apples do expand into gases, however, and rise, and liquids do expand into vapors and rise. Cycles do not end in gravity. That is but their halfway point where they simultaneously reverse their every attribute. They reverse their directions, their potentials, their polarities, their densities, their spectrum of colors, and their weight. One attribute cannot be reversed without reversing all. The polarizing direction of gravity multiplies the power of all expressions of force, while depolarizing direction of radiation divides them all in equal but opposite ratios. The attribute of attraction which Newton gives to falling bodies exploding inward toward gravity should also apply to rising bodies exploding outward toward expanded space. To apply that truth, we would have to say, every particle of matter in the universe repels every other particle with a force which varies inversely as the product of the masses and directly as the square of the distance. Can it be true that every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter in the universe and also repels every other particle? How can either or both be true when each denies the truth of the other? Matter neither attracts nor repels matter. Matter moves in two opposite directions for the sole purpose of simulating idea in formed bodies by dynamic action-reaction sequences, and then seeks rest in the light of idea to reawaken desire for again simulating idea. All motion is unbalanced. All motion is forever seeking rest from its unbalanced condition by seeking voidance of its motion. 14. The Fallacy of Newton's Mathematics Even though an astronomer might find a new planet by applying the mathematics of Newton, this fact does not prove the claim made for it. A noted example of the attempt to prove a false premise by equations, which have merit in them as equations, but do not have the least factual merit, was Newton's attempt to prove mathematically that the moon would fall upon the earth if it were not for a mythical initial impulse, which gave the moon just the right speed to keep it from falling upon the earth or from flying off at a tangent. As a preliminary to what I intend to say upon this subject, the moon is not only not falling upon the planet, but is slowly spiraling away from it. Furthermore, all planets in any solar system and all moons of all planets and all suns, planets, and moons of every nebular system in the heavens are all spiraling away from their primaries. This is nature's method of preparing for rebirth. Water vapor rises from water for the same reason, to disintegrate. Every body disintegrates after it has passed the maturity point, which marks the generative half of its cycle. But disintegration and death are but preparations for regeneration into life. Suns wind up centripetally to polarize. When they have become true spheres, 
they unwind centrifugally to depolarize. To depolarize, they throw off rings from their equators. Rings become planets, which likewise throw off centrifugally spiraling rings which become moons. This is nature's method of returning her polarized bodies to the zero of their source. She divides her masses into expanding systems, and this division continues until matter has been swallowed up by space. Newton evidently did not know of this depolarizing principle of nature. He assumed that the moon has weight in respect to the earth, just as a cannonball has weight in respect to the earth. Believing in the deceptive evidence of the senses, he calculated the speed of continued momentum needed to keep a cannonball from either falling to the earth or from flying off at a tangent. On the assumption that the moon has weight in respect to the earth just as the cannonball has, he proved to the world that the moon would fall to the earth if it were not for the initial impulse which kept the moon from falling. And that is the belief of science today, because of the belief that weight is a fixed property of matter, instead of being an ever-changing property of ever-changing polarity. 15. Two as yet unknown facts of nature. While considering Newton's laws, I would like to touch lightly upon two as yet unknown characteristics of nature. 1. One of these is the fact that every simultaneous and sequential action-reaction is in reverse of the other, yet nature never reverses its direction from the instant polarization begins. It then extends its dividing effects into two opposite directions, each the reverse of the other, until both of those extensions are voided in their zero of origin even though they traverse the universe in so doing. The illusion of reversal is so convincing that it seems incredible that it is not factual. The inward thrust of gravity is in the reverse direction of the outward thrust of radiation. Clockwise spirals are the reverse of anti-clockwise spirals. Yet each is born out of the other without a reversal of direction even though the effect seems to be in reverse direction. This must have been intuitively divined by Newton when he wrote his first law. The words continue in a straight line, have in them a suggestion of his intuitive understanding of that principle, which he was unable to express in the measure of his inspiration. In many such ways he gives evidence of the mystic in him. 2. The other characteristic is the strange effect of polarity which causes all actions reactions in nature to forever turn inside out and outside in. This illusory effect contributes to the simulation of reversal in nature, giving to nature the sequences of solid bodies of incandescent suns surrounded by vacuous black holes of space followed by the reverse effect of vacuous black holes of space surrounded by tenuous rings of what had been incandescent suns. This fact will be further explained later when discussing the gyroscope principle. Compression of this two-way pulsing effect in nature makes it more easy to comprehend the rhythmic heartbeat of the universal cosmic pump for its pistons must continue the in-breathing, out-breathing sequences in every particle of matter in the universe, to simulate the eternal life principle by eternal repetitions of life-death cycles. Comprehension of this fact will also clarify the illusion which this cosmic cinema really is, and also make understandable the reason why any happening anywhere happens everywhere. Further clarification of these secrets of the invisible universe would unnecessarily lengthen this treatise. But before passing, I will give a law which is valid in nature. This new law which is fully explained in the home study course is as follows. Every action-reaction in nature is voided as it occurs, as recorded as it is voided, and repeated as it is recorded. This 
is a zero universe of seeming. Its seeming reality is but a mirage extended from two zeros upon the blank screen of space to create the illusion of reality in an unreal universe. 16. Inadequacy of Kepler's First Law The saving grace of Kepler's mathematics lies in the fact that he did not try to prove by them a premise or conclusion which is not true as Newton did by claiming that his equations proved that matter always attracts matter, and that the moon is falling on the earth. His laws are free from such claims and demonstrate to a high degree the orderliness of effects of strains and tensions in a wave field. If wave fields were not balanced in their polarity, such laws would not work out in nature as they do. It is because of the absolute equality of division of opposing pressures in every wave field that such laws are workable. Kepler's first law reads as follows. Each planet moves around the sun in an ellipse with the sun in one of its foci. This law is right as far as it goes, but there are two foci to every orbit and each of them has equal power in determining the rates of acceleration and deceleration of speed. Just as Newton's law accounted for the falling apple, but ignored the other half of the apple cycle from the zero of its beginning to the zero of its ending, so likewise Kepler's first law accounts for but one half of an orbit by the reference to only one of its two foci. Every orbit is balanced and controlled by four magnetic poles, not two. It has not yet been known that there are four magnetic poles, but a three-dimensional cube sphere universe would be impossible with only the two north-south poles. I will enlarge more upon these four magnetic poles in a later chapter and describe the separate offices which each fulfills and the extension and retraction of wave fields. The two unknown east-west poles which control the shortening and lengthening elliptical orbits are those inferentially referred to in the Kepler law. In order to comprehend the periodicity of the familiar north-south magnetic poles, it is necessary to comprehend the relationship between these two opposing pairs of north-south and east-west magnetic poles and their manner of extension from a common fulcrum and the retraction to it. As planets ablate, their north-south poles gradually move away from their poles of rotation. Our Earth has been sufficiently ablate for its magnetic poles to move to an angle of 23 degrees from the pole of rotation. This periodicity is balanced by an angular periodicity of planets' equators moving away from the equators of their centering suns, where all planets of all systems are born from rings. The equator of our Earth has moved out of the plane of the solar equator to keep pace with the polar shift. Each must balance the other. The four magnetic poles control that balance. These are the important facts which should have been inquired into when Kepler wrote his law. It is not important to know that the Sun is in one of its orbital foci if the tremendous significance of the two foci is ignored. The amazing fact is that matter and space are playing seesaw with each other in the proportions of an ant and an elephant. The mechanics which balance and control such a stupendous game with such mathematical precision is the important thing to know. An ant and an elephant can play seesaw if the ant has a sufficient long lever, and that is practically what is happening throughout the universe, suns and planets being the ant and space being the elephant. The planets and moons of all solar systems are gradually tearing their suns into rings in a most orderly manner, with a precision which is mathematically measured in direct and inverse ratios. The four magnetic poles in two opposing pairs control this amazing performance of nature within every wave. That is the important thing to know. By means of this knowledge of God's ways in nature, we can make them our ways in the laboratory, 
and thus have a command over nature which man has never had beyond the comprehension of his day. It seems incredible that Kepler could have known of these two east-west poles without having realized their purpose and their necessity in a three-dimensional universe. Knowledge of God's ways will alone give science the power to balance all effects in the universe of man's making as God balances them in the universe of his making. The precision of every effect in God's universe is so perfectly managed that an astronomer can calculate to the split second the position of any planet in the solar system or as accurately foretell an eclipse of one by the other. The secret of man's ability to control his universe lies in the knowledge of the tonal octave wave and its field. Therefore know the wave in all of its simplicity of three times three in numbered effect, multiplied to infinite complexity, but still not passing beyond the three times three of man's easy comprehension. The first step in acquiring knowledge of the wave field must be the great revolution in scientific thinking in regard to matter itself. In order to control matter, science must know what it is and all of the various steps of its generation from zero into form and its degeneration back to zero. It must know matter for what it is instead of believing it to be what it is not and working with it on that premise. The rest of this treatise will be devoted to clarifying the meaning of this one subject. 17. Regarding the Quantum Theory This theory claims not only that energy is within matter, but that it exists in bundles. Its very basis has no relation to nature anywhere, nor to the workings of polarity, the great divider, nor to the electric wave. One part of the theory describes certain microscopic resonators embedded within particles of matter to make it vibrate. These are set in motion, according to a recent article in Scientific American, by light entering through holes which must be of just the right size in every case to cause the vibrations to release these bundles of energy. Nothing could be more fantastic nor more of a travesty of nature for the only cause of vibration is polarity. The only vibrations there are in nature are those interchanges between the two opposites of polarity which extend from a zero to a plus and minus zero. These are the destination points between which motion oscillates in sequences of reversals. The reversals are the pulse beats of nature. 18. Regarding singly charged particles, just as it is impossible to polarize the positive end of a bar magnet without simultaneously polarizing the negative, or to depolarize one end separately, or to create a battery of one cell without simultaneously creating its opposite cell, or to create one hemisphere of a planet without simultaneously creating the other, or to lift one end of a lever without simultaneously lowering the other, or to deep freeze without generating heat. So, it is impossible for man or nature to produce singly charged negative, positive, or neutral particles. There are no negatively charged particles in this universe. Negative electricity discharges while positive electricity charges. The negative depolarizing force functions in the opposite manner and direction to the positive polarizing force. Positive electricity produces the condition of gravity by compression, which means charging or generating. Negative electricity produces the condition of radiation by expanding which means discharging or degenerating. It is impossible for one of the polarized conditions to be present without the other, for each opposite borns its mate and interchanges with it until each one becomes the other. All particles of matter in the universe are alike in one respect, whether that particle is an invisible electron, planet, or sun. 
That universal attribute is the fact that each has two opposing hemispheres which are under the control of two opposing balance poles. One pole controls its charge and the other its discharge. Together, they keep the universe in balance. As there is not one law for microscopic mass and another law for colossal mass, let us consider the Earth as a typical example keeping in mind the fact that colossal mass is but many small particles. The Earth is being constantly charged into higher potential by the centripetal multiplying force of positive electricity which polarizes and vitalizes. Incoming sun rays to Earth are a good example. Conversely, the Earth is being constantly discharged into lower potential by the centrifugal dividing force of negative electricity, which depolarizes and devitalizes. Witness outgoing Earth rays. Both are the same rays. They have but changed their polarities by reversing their outward direction of expansion to an inward direction of contraction. When sun rays leave their cathode in the sun, they are negative particles, or vortices of motion, which we call matter. Their polarity constantly changes until they change their direction at the equator between the sun and the earth. They then become centripetally contracting vortices instead of centrifugally expanding ones. After passing their equator, their polarity is positive instead of negative. Their positive charges increase as they near their anode, the earth. The reverse effect takes place in respect to radiation leaving the Earth which is now the cathode for the projected vortice of spiral motion, and the Sun is its anode. The simultaneous charge and discharge of every particle or mass of particles is repeated sequentially in wave pulsations which constitute the universal heartbeat. Every particle in the universe breathes in and out in polarization-depolarization sequences. As there is no exception to this law, it cannot be possible for nature or man to create particles which are singly charged. Science has listed about 20 of these separately charged particles and claimed for them different attributes, just as the elements are presumed to be different substances with different attributes. The time has come when we must think of matter in a new way our old concept of substance and of the attributes of substance, which we call matter, must radically change. That revolutionary change is what I now wish to talk about. The preceding pages are but a preparation for a complete transformation of thought concerning matter. 19. Future science must completely revolutionize its concept of matter. For ages, man has thought of matter as being substance. Posterity must learn to think of matter as motion only. The senses of man have for such long eons told him of the many different substances which compose the universe. Therefore, it will not be easy for him to make this transition. The granite rock, the iron bar, the steel ship, and the many other substances which hurt him by too rough contact or burn him with their heat, or refresh him with their cool wetness, or nourish him with the meat of their bodies, or lend their bodies to him for the fashioning of countless things of his desiring. All these many things of seeming substance of earths and seas have told his senses of his apparently substantial body. They have told him that matter is substance, and that it is real. It unquestionably exists. Objectivity of matter is the most obvious fact of the universe to man's senses. All down the ages the mystics have affirmed that the universe is but illusion, and that there is no life, intelligence, or substance in matter. Abstract affirmations, however, are not convincing to either scientist or layman whose senses have taught him otherwise. Unfortunately for the world, those who speak abstractly 
and affirm without being able to explain dynamically have been listened to with ears which could not hear that which had no meaning for them. The time has now come, however, to give meaning to the inspired mystics and poets who have been illumined with inner knowledge which they found impossible to put into words for man. The foundation principle of the universe is utterly simple, but the simplest of stories is the hardest to tell. It will not be easy for either the layman or the scientist to make the transition in his thinking from a universe of real and dependable substance to a substanceless thought wave universe of motion whose sole purpose is the recording of thought imaginings. The result of such motion is to create a make-believe universe in which both substance and form are simulated by as many states of motion as there are simulated substances and forms in matter. The scientist has not only divided matter into 92 different kinds of substances, but he has divided these 92 substances into atomic systems made up of many more minute particles somewhere around 20 primal substances. These he calls electrons, protons, neutrons, antineutrons, antiprotons, photons, gravitons, mesons, kappa mesons, positive mu mesons, negative mu mesons, positive pi mesons, neutral pi mesons, tau mesons, positive V particles, negative V particles, neutral V particles, and so on. Without an end as yet inside of the many non-existent substances, they so convincingly act their parts in producing the mirages of substance in this universe that the greatest scientist of this world would have not the slightest suspicion that the many different substances of matter are but different states of motion. The reason for this great confusion is because scientific observers started out with the wrong premise from the very beginning. With an unwarranted belief given to the evidence of their senses, science, ever since Democritus, has been searching for an irreducible unit of matter which would account for the universe. It never seems to have occurred to any of the great thinkers of the ages that creation could not create itself. Just as the picture does not paint itself but must have its source in the painter, or as the poem cannot write itself, but must also have its creator poet, so likewise must this master drama of cause and effect have its creator playwright, who conceived the idea of creation and gave it form. One might as reasonably scrape to the bottom of Leonardo da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper, to find its primal pigment and its first brush stroke in the hope of finding the idea which the painting manifest and its creator as well. As neither the idea of creation nor the creator of it are in the pigment which painted the universal masterpiece, and likewise, as the primal pigment and first brush stroke were not the cause of the picture, one might search for countless ages without finding that for which he sought. Having thus started out, with the wrong premise regarding matter, and having passed on these wrong premises and assumptions through generations of teachings which have become traditions to their inheritors, it is not strange that the conclusions of science are as invalid as the premises upon which they have been founded. Science is still searching for the primordial life principle in matter as eagerly as it has searched for the primordial substance from which other substances extend. The time has come in man's mental unfoldment when he must recognize that all idea is eternal in the zero equilibrium of the still magnetic light of universal mind, which is God, and that idea is but manifested in motion of body forms by polarized cycles. These appear from the eternal zero, and must disappear into that zero in order that they may reappear in 
endless cycles. The layman as well as the scientist must think differently and express his thoughts with a greater understanding of natural law. The layman, for example, who says John is dead and thinks of John as being John's body, is not expressing the facts of natural law. John is not John's body. John is not dead, nor can he die. The eternal John is an idea of mind. His depolarized body is but one end of a longer cycle than the cycle of his incoming outgoing breath, but not one whit different. His breathing will repolarize in another second, but his depolarized body will take a longer period just as the depolarized oak will repolarize again from its zero in its seed. The scientist must also think in terms of polarity and use terms which have that connotation in them. I will give an example of my meaning by quoting a paragraph from the Scientific American, January 1952. Even more confusing is the fact that all the mesons, pi and mu, undergo spontaneous disintegration. Why not say that they have become depolarized, or that they have attached their equilibrium, or that they have attained zero? The simple fact is that the motion which gave them to being has ceased. There is no such effect in nature as spontaneous disintegration. I will quote the rest of the same paragraph to call attention to the needless complexity of descriptive terminology which belief in substance seems to make necessary. It is as follows. When left alone in free space, a positive or negative pi meson decays into a positive negative mu meson and a neutrino within about 250 millionths of a second. Then the positive or negative mu meson decays into a positive or negative electron plus two neutrinos within about two millions of a second. The neutral pi meson also is unstable and decays into two gamma rays in a very short time indeed, about a hundred millionth of a millionth of a second. The above is a very complex and confusing way of saying that matter has disappeared by depolarization because motion has ceased. God's universe consists solely of vibrating waves of two-way interchanging motion. Every effect in nature is included in that simplicity. Any child will fully comprehend you when you tell him that sound is an effect caused by rapid vibrations. You can demonstrate it by plucking a harp string so that he can see that the sound is caused by rapid motion. You do not need to tell him that the sound ceases when the motion ceases. His common sense will tell him that. If, however, you tell him the wire is composed of positive protons which decay into negative electrons in a hundred millionth of a second to produce sound, then the negative electrons decay into silence in another hundred millionth of a second, he will look at you blankly and understand not one word of it. All of these many named particles, which science thinks of as differently charged substances, are all basically the same spiral units of motion. These are constantly being transformed from one condition to another, as each divided pair obeys the polarizing charge of gravity until it has completed the outward half of its journey. To its reversal point of rest. It then returns as each one depolarizes and withdraws within its fulcrum zero of rest. Exactly the same thing is true of all the elements. Science has given them 92 names and listed their many attributes, such as metals, metalloids, and nonmetals, alkalis, and acids, brittle and pliable, conductive and non-conductive, dense, liquid, soft, gaseous, and many other attributes. To anyone, whether scientist or layman, a piece of iron, a piece of aluminum, and a lump of gold are three different metals which have always been, and always will be, just what they unquestionably are. 
3. On alterably different substances. Any other interpretation of them would be unthinkable. That is the kind of thinking, however, which must be relegated to past ages. Mankind must henceforth learn to look upon matter as a transient motion picture record of the idea which it simulates. For that is what it really is. A cosmic cinema thrown upon the majestic screen of space.